Azure Functions are a serverless concept allowing us to write a piece of code and deploy it to the cloud without having to provision or manage any infrastructure. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can create an Azure function that is running on .NET 7, and I'm going to walk you through everything that you need to know in order to get started with Azure Functions. Let's start by creating a new project in Visual Studio, and we're going to use the Azure Functions template to get us started. I'm going to walk you through the process of creating your first Azure function. So let's head over to the next screen. First, you have to choose the name and the location for your project. And when you are satisfied with that, you can head over to the next screen. Here, we are choosing which version of .NET we want to be running our Azure function on. I have a few options available to me. I'm going to choose the .NET 7 isolated version for the Azure functions. Isolated Azure Functions are available with the version 4 of the Azure Functions runtime and this is the latest version that is supported by .NET 6 and .NET 7 and you can also run it on .NET Framework if you want to but I'm going to use .NET 7 for this example. The next thing that we have to choose is the trigger that is going to execute our function. So there are many triggers to choose from such as the blob storage trigger, the Cosmos DB, you can even add RabbitMQ or service bus triggers. I'm going to start out simple and I'm going to choose an HTTP trigger because this is going to allow us to test our Azure function. So I'm going to choose that. I'm going to enable Docker. And for the authorization level, I'm just going to set anonymous because I want anyone to be able to run my Azure function. And if I'm happy with this, I can click create and let's see what we get. So this is what we get out of the box with the Azure Functions template. We have one function with an HTTP trigger. Let me just format this a little bit better so you can see what's going on. So we have this file which represents our Azure function and inside of it we have one method with an HTTP trigger defined and this tells the Azure function when it needs to execute. You have various triggers available. I'm using HTTP trigger here because it's the simplest one to showcase. Let's see what else we have with the HTTP trigger. We have the authorization level, which we set to anonymous so that anyone can call and trigger our Azure function. Then we have get and post here, which tells the Azure function which HTTP endpoints are supported when triggering this function. And another argument that you have access to that is invisible here and I'm going to show you right now. You can access the route by setting the route property and now you can define a specific route that you want to assign to your Azure function. So let's give it a route of walkthrough and this is going to define the Azure function at this route. Notice that we are getting the raw HTTP request data. We can use the HTTP request to create an appropriate response, in this case a 200 OK response. We are setting the content type header on the response and we can write a string to the response body that is returned when you call this Azure function. You can also do something like this. Instead of setting the content type header and writing a string to the response body, you can call the write as JSON async method to specify an object instance that you want to write to the response body. And this method is going to automatically set the appropriate content type, which is going to be application JSON, so that you don't have to. So let's use this example. I'm going to create an anonymous object and let's assign it a few properties. Let's give it a name property with the value of Azure function. And let's also, for example, return the current time by calling UTC now. Because this method is asynchronous, we need to await it. So I'm going to convert my function to be an asynchronous function. So it has to return a task. And now I just have to await the write as JSON async method. Since the write as JSON async method is going to set the status code to 200 OK, I don't have to specify it when creating the initial HTTP response. Notice that we have a function attribute decorating our method. And this tells the runtime that this method is actually supposed to be an Azure function. And this name here is just a unique identifier for your Azure function. It can be anything. I'm going to rename it to HTTP function, for example. And then when I start my application, it's going to create an Azure function with this name. 
you can also rename the file containing your functions. For example, we can name it just functions if we want to define more than one function. And this is also something that you can do. You are not limited to just defining a single function per Azure function project. You can actually define as many individual Azure functions as you want and then deploy them all at once into the same Azure function instance in the cloud. So for example, if you have a simple web API with just a few endpoints, you can define these endpoints as HTTP triggered Azure functions and deploy them all to the same Azure functions instance. Let's explore a few more things before running our Azure function. Notice that we have a host JSON file. This file is used to configure all of the functions that are deployed together in the same Azure Functions application. For example, here we have the logging configuration and you can add additional values. So this is how I can set the default log level to all of the Azure Functions in this application to information. We also have the local settings JSON file that you can use to define configuration values that are local to your development environment. You should define your custom configuration values inside of the values section so if I want to add a custom configuration value, I would do that like this and I can assign it some value. If you need to define connection strings, you can do that either inside of the value section, but you won't be able to use the get connection string extension method on the I configuration interface. So to be able to use the get connection string method, you would have to define your connection strings outside inside of their own configuration section. So something like this, you can say connection strings and then you can define the connection strings that you need. For example, we can add a database connection string if we need to connect to some database like SQL Server. And you would add the value for the connection string right here. We also have the program.cs file where we can configure some custom behavior on our Azure function. With the isolated Azure functions model, you can run middleware for your functions for the first time. To add a middleware to your Azure functions, Inside of the configure functions worker defaults, you need to specify an expression. I'm going to say builder and on the functions builder, I can call the use middleware method to specify a middleware that I want to execute on my Azure functions. For example, let's add a very simple exception handling middleware to our project. To make it compatible with Azure functions, your middleware has to implement a specific interface. And this interface is the I functions worker middleware interface. Let's implement this interface and see what it has inside. You can see we have one asynchronous method, which is called invoke, and it gets passed in a function context and a function execution delegate. We have support for dependency injection. So let's inject an I logger of exception handling middleware so that we can log our exceptions. And inside of the middleware, let's add a simple try catch statement we have to invoke our function execution delegate by calling await next and we have to specify the function context. Of course, this has to be an asynchronous method. And if we encounter any exception, instead of writing to the console, let's call logger log error. Let's pass in the exception and define a simple message like something went wrong. And how you would use this middleware is back in program.cs we can say use middleware and specify exception handling middleware. You can also configure your application services here by calling configure services and you get access to a nice service collection instance that you can use to define your services as in any ASP.NET Core application like a web API. So you can say services, add scoped or transient or singleton and define your services with dependency injection. Now let's see what happens when we run our application. Our Azure Functions instance is running and we have a lot of contextual information, but what's important is that you get a list of all of the Azure Functions that you have defined inside of your application. If you recall, we named our first function HTTP function. It had the get and post endpoints allowed and we specified the route to be walkthrough. Let's head over to Postman and try to call our Azure function on this endpoint. I already prepared a GET request and if we send it, you can see that we hit the breakpoint inside of our Azure function and we can debug it normally in development environment. And this is really great when you are still developing your Azure function. So let's walk through this method, create our response, 
write the response as JSON, and let's see what we get back in Postman. So you can see that we get the proper JSON response with the name and the current time. I mentioned that we can define more than one HTTP function inside of the same application, so I'm going to show you that right now. Let's copy over the implementation for our function, and let's give it a name of current time. Inside of this function, I'm going to return just the current time. So let me simplify this method a little. Let's remove this logging here. Let's give it a route of current time UTC. It's only going to have a get endpoint, so let's remove post. And let's pass current time to the function attribute as the name of our Azure function. So if I start the application again, you can see that this time we have two Azure functions available. One is our HTTP function that we started with, and the second one is the current time function with just the get endpoint. And let's see if this is working properly. So if I call our current time Azure function, you can see that we get the proper response back. If you're enjoying this video about Azure functions so far, make sure that you smash that like button and also subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss some of the future videos where I'm going to explore the more advanced concepts of Azure functions. I showed you how you can define multiple HTTP trigger functions inside of the same application, but you can also define functions with a different trigger. The simplest way to do that is by adding a new Azure function to our project and let's choose a different trigger for our Azure function. Let's take a timer trigger, for example, and see how that works. When we add a timer trigger function, this is what we get out of the box. This time, instead of an HTTP trigger, we have a timer trigger, which tells us how often our Azure function should run. And you also get access to a timer object, which is defined right here, which contains some additional status information about your timer trigger function. If you enjoyed this short and sweet introduction to Azure Functions, make sure that you smash that like button and also subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any of my future videos. Until next time, stay awesome.